do you know that God designed your body to believe? To trust Him. And when you take Him at His word and you guide your focus, you intentionally set your focus on Him with the intention to believe and apply the word Every physical thing about your body, every system, every, every neuron will begin to fire and align itself, every neurochemical, every, um, uh, every um, what's the word for dopamine and hormone, what? Neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter, all of that stuff. All of that stuff that you should never even have to worry about or think about, it all is designed to serve you, to focus, help you physically be receptive and, and narrow even your focus down to moving toward this thing that is the object of your attention. Unfortunately, because we have death and destruction and sin and fear and all that stuff in the world, those things become our focus and so our bodies begin to reflect and our minds and our thoughts and our hearts get set on all of this stuff and so we run these patterns. I'm kind of actually sliding into my message here a little bit, <clears throat> but uh, I was listening to this video and this guy was talking about how 90% of your thoughts are the same from day to day. You think the same things, you feel the same things, you have the same responses to the same situations over and over and over and over and over and over. And we wonder why we get stuck. And so that 10% might be dealing with something new, and because new things are unfamiliar, we often reject the opportunity to grow. So we settle back down into that 90% of repetition that's in our, in our lives, you know? And he, he has this statement, he says, the body becomes the brain. And what that means is we become so programmed to follow our senses. We become so programmed to do what we feel like doing, don't do what we feel like, don't not feel like doing, and have the same, resp yeah, that one, and have the same responses to the same opportunities and face the, and constantly put ourselves back in the same place. And it's hard to grow. It's hard to overcome fear and worry and doubt, much less hold on to something that's impossible as a possibility. In other words, a spiritual reality overriding a physical reality unto the point of manifestation. We all believe. We're, we're, we're all open to believing the Word of God and the promises of God. But few of us believe until the promise manifests. We, 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 we try, well, no, I, I, I tried to believe. Well, how long? Eh, about two minutes. <laughs> I prayed for a couple of weeks, but did you really? I'm talking to me too, and I'm not beating you up, because what I, here's my goal. I want the body of Christ, I want those of you that are in this church, I want us to be so receptive to the leading of the Spirit of God in your life that you can say, like Jesus did, I only do that which he leads me to do, and I only say that which he leads me to say. Now, that is an impossible goal. You'll never get there, just so you know. But you can be led by God. You can be infused by life and courage and grace and strength to overcome those sinful habits, to overcome those fearful patterns, to overcome constantly dating the same destructive person over and over and over again, to overcome those feelings of, well, you know what, maybe in this identity thing, I am kind of, well, I do feel a little fluid, no? you know? All of that stuff that gets, that, that feels true, that feels true, but if you get into that spiritual mindset, you realize, no, this is, this is just my body craving something. This is just a desire. Yeah. Whether you realize it or not, it is very easy to overcome sinful habits if you know how to do it. But if you do it like most of the church does, you're stuck and you, you don't see a way out. You just kind of, we accept, most people, most Christians with sin habits accept just kind of this low-level sense of guilt and shame, assume the identity of this behavior, and continue to repeat it as long as it's not hurting anybody. And we just kind of come to the conclusion, well, you know, it's just something I'm going to deal with for my whole life. And that's not a conscious process that we run, but it is a belief of the heart. <clears throat> you assume it as your identity, and you continue to repeat it. But you can overcome that. 
You can overcome anything. And, 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 and even something that seems impossible because the spirit of the living God is inside of you if you've said yes to Jesus, where nothing is impossible. I mean, what can he not do? And even that statement, it's not about waiting for him to do it because really everything that we need is already provided in Christ. It's just a matter of cultivating that place cultivating His Word, hiding His Word in our hearts, doing the hard work of disciplining our minds to believe His Word over our circumstances, trusting that it will grow. That Word, that will grow unto fruit. It just will. It just will. Well, why hasn't it already? Well, it's not Him. It's not on His side of the equation. It's us. So I want to talk about today this idea of grace and peace. You know, you see in a lot of the letters in Scripture, <clears throat> grace and peace to you, grace and peace to you. And, it, and some theologians will even present this as if it's just a salutation, grace and peace, brother, grace and peace, sister. You know, it's not. It's, it's, he's setting the tone of how we're going to live this stuff out. You know, most of the letters that Paul wrote, they were to correct an error that had started to creep into the early church he would always summarize the gospel. He would always affirm identity. He would always affirm that grace is available and powerful and it's, it's, a, it's a force from God that works in you to bring transformation. And then he would always address, this is how you apply it to real life and all the different situations that Paul would go through and talk about. This is how the gospel should affect this area. The way that you experience transformation, the way that you live the word, the way that you obey God, and bring glory to His name is not in your self-effort or in striving. It's in this environment of grace and peace. Say grace and peace. So we're going to break this down a little bit today. If I were to give this <clears throat> a title, kind of a long title, but today is How to Guard and Heal a Sick Heart with Grace and Peace. And I have a couple, I'm going to give you a couple thoughts and then we'll look at some solutions. This, uh, this passage was really rolling around in my heart. Uh, Proverbs 13, 12, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And the word sick is weak, tired, grieved, or wounded. Hope deferred, so let's break this down. Hope, what is hope? Hope is... Confident expectation of good things. Deferred is drawn out or delayed. And sick, so hope deferred makes the heart sick, weak and tired. Do you ever, does your heart feel weak and tired and grieved and wounded in any area? Well, hope deferred. The confident expectation of good things, the promises of God, the benefits of salvation, the, the prophecies that have been given to you, you know, hopefully you don't build your life on those, but they can be affirming and confirming. But, the, you, you know, we should live. We, we are designed to, you know, so your body works better when you are happy. I don't think that's a mistake. Your body, your brain, your mental health is better when you're feeling positive and good emotions. You know, so I don't want to, it's not that we're talking about, I, don't, I, want to, I want to preach something just to make you feel good. That's not what I'm saying. Look at how God designed creation. It's incredible. But we also see the opposite in that things start to break down when our body's not functioning according to the way God designed everything to work, which is ultimately sin, which brings death, right? So hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And isn't that a true thing? Did you, you find it over there? If you got a knot, we'll pray for that knot in your neck, by the way. Which, by the way, I distract myself. We're, we want to keep Tori and his family in our hearts and minds. Tori, didn't Tori do a great job last week? Yeah, they're, they're probably watching today. But his brother, so most of you know, his brother is sick and in uh, the emergency room and, or, or in ICU. And he has become aware enough to indicate he doesn't want to be on the ventilator anymore. He's, he's, he's affirming to them, I want to be off of it. 
they asked him, do you know what that means? You know, and it's a he walked me through a pretty serious detailed thing and, and, and uh, they, that's what they're doing. Basically their family is with him. And so Father, we just lift up Tori and his family to you. May you give them comfort and peace and strength. And, and uh, we thank you for his brother, Robert, who does know you. We thank you that he's a believer. And, and however the situation unfolds, barring a miracle, we just give you glory, and we thank you for peace and comfort for their family. Amen, amen. So even, as a, even in a situation like that, you know, where you, we believe in miracles, you know, my own mom, we've all lost people. We've all prayed for situations and they didn't work out the right way. Have you ever prayed and it didn't work out the way you prayed? You had an opportunity to become heart sick. And... Also, the promises that Jesus paid for us to experience, the fact that we don't always experience them, you have the opportunity to become heart sick. So what do we do about it? Most people within Christianity, what they do is they adopt beliefs that reflect circumstances. Circumstantial theology. My theology is built by what happened to me in this earth. Most people have circumstantial theology, where what we should have is a biblical theology. In other words, theology being what we believe about God should only come out of Scripture. If Scripture says that this is the way it should be, then that's what you should believe. I don't care what it looks like in this world. In fact, you hold on to Scripture in your heart to the point that what's going on in your life isn't impacting you as much as what the Word says is possible inwardly for fruit and for the displaying of power outwardly. No matter what, no matter what. It makes us, you have to have spiritual mindset. You have to have a kingdom mindset. You have to be able to, and it's not that we live in denial. It's not that you ignore life's situations and unplug and stick your head in the sand and act like nothing's wrong. You don't deny symptoms, you don't deny science, you don't deny realities, but there's a greater reality. It just is. If, if you don't have that mindset, you're locked into the best that you can do in your flesh, in your own strength, and in your own self-effort. Today we're talking about grace, which is actually God's ability in you. So we're going to keep going. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. <clears throat> but there has, there is some good news. Grace and peace, guard and heal a sick heart. Are you with me? I'm going slow just so that I don't make the point here. Grace and peace, right? All right, let's look at a few passages. This is Proverbs 4.23. We're going to talk about the idea. of So, so again, hope deferred makes the heart sick. You know what? Let me, let me just go ahead. and why, why is it important to deal with the heart so much? Why is it important to deal with what's going on in the heart? I have a slide for it. It looks like it didn't make its way in. All right, so what is the heart? The heart is the new you. It's that place that God renews. God gives you a new heart when you get born again. It's the place where... God sheds His light, His life, and His peace, and His love. What you believe in your heart, as you believe in your heart, so is He. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, but I, but I thought the heart was wicked. Well, it was before you got born again, but He gave you a new one. You think He's going to give you a wicked one? <laughs> I don't think so. He gives you a heart that is infused with how to obey Him naturally. You used to have to try to obey God externally with the laws written in stone or passed down verbally. That's how you had to obey God. Now what God does is He gives you a new internal operating system, a new nature. You truly are a new creature. And that new core, that new operating system, that new being, that new seat of your being, that new center that defines you, the heart, naturally knows how to follow and obey God. And when you cultivate that environment where the heart is with peace, you allow peace to reign in that place where your heart is, your heart will choose to obey God because it's not wicked and evil anymore. It's programmed with the nature of God. 
David prayed, God created me a clean heart, and he did with Christ. You have that clean heart that David prayed for. Now, you can let the world creep in and your carnal desires and trauma and sin can not corrupt the heart, but cause it to believe lies. So in other words, your heart can be deceived, but as soon as the deception is away, in other words, the heart doesn't naturally crave sin like the old nature. It craves righteousness and holiness, but you got to clear out the stuff that's overshadowing what it's designed to do now. Are you with me? It's kind of like a plant that's in the ground. You have to cultivate the environment around it so it will grow into what it's naturally designed to do. The seed, so he places eternity in your heart. Your heart is like a new kingdom seed that is trying to grow into your life to conform you to the image of Christ. You're not trying to be something that you aren't. You're trying to clear the world away so that what God has done in you can grow out unto glorification of God. You inwardly look like Christ as you push the world out it increases upon you naturally. Does that make sense? I think I said it about 27 different ways trying to make the same point. But So the heart, it's a big deal. Talking about being heart sick, overcoming that, overcoming being wounded, wounded in the heart. A little bit more on what the heart says. This is three different uh, translations here. Uh, Proverbs 4, 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Above all else, guard your heart Everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And if your heart is sick, if it's weak, tired, grieved, or wounded, it's hard. It's hard to believe unto manifestation. I, I was sick last week. It's no fun being sick. You ever, you ever been sick? That's a dumb question. <laughs> you ever been sick? But when you're sick, you just don't feel like doing anything. Like you got those vitamins there. You don't even feel like, it's like, oh, that's, I don't even feel like taking that. Anybody else like me? It's like, it's like the things that you know you should do that are good for your body that you should put in there, you don't even feel like doing those. Anybody else ever find yourself in that? Yeah. It's like, oh, I just, no, I just feel so bad. I just want to lay here and feel sorry for myself. And Sarah was like, put on some worship music. Read the Bible. Go pray. <laughs> and I was like, Ugh. Ugh. Pray. Ugh. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. You just don't feel like doing the things that you know you should do. Not to try to make God happy or try to earn something, but because here's what I know. If I go put on some worship music, if I start taking vitamins, if I start get out, take a walk, do some breathing exercises, I'm going to start feeling better, but I don't feel like doing it. <laughs> this bed is comfortable. Watching this show that's making it worse. Putting in death. Yeah, are you with me? So that's just your physical body being sick. Imagine if you're heart sick. What's the cure for heart sickness? It's to believe. It's faith. It's to trust God. It's to overcome whatever it is that's wounded you. Whatever it is that's caused you to become weary. Whatever it is that's, that's caused the weakness internally. You know, when you're heart sick, you don't feel like putting in the effort to believe, to trust God, to pray, to renew your mind, to overcome that thing. It's just easier to just sin and repent and get over it. That, that, that's, that's the deception of denominationalism. It's that, well, you know what, I'm just going to go to church, I'm going to do the best I can, and I'm going to get saved every week, and I uh, hope I make it to heaven. You know, it's like denominationalism, it's, not, it's pretty easy. You just show up, go to church, and then you just try your best. I, we don't have that opportunity. We don't have that excuse. You don't, you don't have that. Uh, um, that's not an option. Because grace will not let you stay heart sick. Grace is going to constantly, it's like my wife in my ear telling me, go worship, go pray, take some vitamins. Did you drink any water today? My goodness, if I heard that another time. <laughs> Thank you. I, but you're with me, right? That, that's why sin's not fun when you're a Christian. The Holy Spirit's in there going, no, this is not who you are. That's why when you're 
you, you naturally fight against depression and worry and lack and sin as a believer because you know that that's not the state of the Holy Spirit in you. Those things are contrary to what God desires for you. you so you have to harden your heart to make it easy to stay in that stuff. In other words, you got to put forth effort to not let the grace of God arise in your heart to spring up that desire. And unfortunately, because of performance-centered Christianity, when, natu when naturally spiritual desires rise up in our heart to overcome sin, to overcome destructive emotions, we, it makes us feel guilty. Let me say that again. Unfortunately, we respond with guilt to the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives often. Because our religious, performance-centered, guilt and shame mindset has conditioned us to feel guilty when God starts speaking to us. Oh, I'm, oh gosh, yeah, you're right, man. I should, boy, I hadn't been reading. Uh, you know, so here it is. You're sick. Here comes the Holy Spirit. Why don't you go spend some time in Isaiah 53? Oh, gosh, I haven't been reading the Bible enough. Man, I'll tell you what, I don't even, where is my, I don't even know where my Bible is, you know. And so the guilt sets in rather than, oh, that's a great idea. Let me go feed on the Word of God in this moment. Let me go walk through what the Messiah, God in the flesh, went through for me to be set free from sin and death. Why wouldn't we do that? I don't feel like it. And not just healing. I hope y'all still love me, but I've got this question. <laughs> Somehow the notes got... Oh, here, here's the question. Let me ask you this question. Do you intend to, pl to apply the Logos or the Word of God to your life, or do you just want to hear more information? I've done this for quite a while now. And this is not a guilt. This I'm talking to myself too. But I've sat in my office with a lot of people, and they'll say very clearly and logically, here's my problem. Okay, let's look what the Word of God says about it. Here's what the Word of God says. Do you see that? Yes, I see it. Do you agree with that? Yes, I agree with that. Let's create a plan. Let's map out, and let's map out a path forward for you to apply the Word of God to your heart in the expectation that it will bring transformation and you will overcome whatever this situation is. Do you believe that the word works that way? Yes. How, what are you going to do? What's your plan? Let's write out your plan. Let's create an actual schedule of intentionally feeding on the word of God with the expectation that it will produce manifestation, it will produce transformation, and you will overcome this situation. Do you agree? Do you commit to this? Yes, I will do that. You see them two weeks later. How's it going? Oh, I'm not sure what I did with that list. I'm not going to... I did it a couple days. I did it a couple days. And I want to give them the boot. It's like, well, I don't have anything I can do for you. I have, there's nothing I can do for you. I can't do anything for you if you're not going to take the Word of God and feed on it. Hide it in your heart. Believe it. Trust it. Not doubt it. With the expectation, it will bear fruit. What else is there? Uh, by the way, if you're sitting there thinking, well, that's a pretty good idea. I think I'll go to the Scripture and actually create a plan to believe. Uh, I'll help you. I will help you. Reach out. Call me. Email me. Well, let's set up a schedule. I've got a couple of great websites, great resources. I will, I will help you create the schedule to feed on the Word of God and, and, and map out a path forward for you. It's very easy. It's not that difficult. The Word works. But will we work the Word? That's kind of a cheesy little saying, but yeah, anyway. All right, let's keep going. Hebrews 13, 9. Don't be carried away about with various and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established by grace. Just a reminder. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the thing 
Some, some refer to it, Susan, I've been talking about this. If you understand, how many of you have a little bit of understanding about the subconscious mind? You know, that aspect of you that believes things, whether rational or irrational, that drives behavior, that in your mind, you're thinking, I don't want to do this, but you just, here we go. It's like you're watching the car roll forward and you can't stop it. Your subconscious is driving your life. Biblically, the heart is described in that way, and I personally think it goes a little bit deeper into that spiritual aspect. But there is a part of you that is encoded with beliefs about who you think that you are that are driving your feelings, thoughts, and behaviors beyond what you know to be true. That's the conflict. That's why life is hard sometimes, because we, we know what we should do, but we don't do it, because our heart is driving our life. Your heart, what you believe in your heart is arranging even your physical body to attract to you situations that you believe you deserve in spite of what you think. That's why we have to renew our minds, to get our minds in alignment with who we are in Christ, in alignment with the will of God, so that our heart begins to believe the Word of God and feeds on the Word of God and hosts this, the Word of God inwardly with the expectation, like Jesus said in Mark 4, this is the mystery of the kingdom. It's like a farmer that casts seed in the ground. He goes to sleep. He wakes up. He doesn't know how it happens. But the, the Word bears fruit after itself. The seed bears fruit after its own kind. You put the Word in there that's related to the area of your life that you want to see change, and it will bear fruit. Do you believe that? What else do you have? I'm not mad at you. I feel like I'm kind of toning it down here a minute. Let's go here. Uh, Hebrews 13, 9. It's a, for it's a good thing that the heart be established by grace. We're going to talk about grace. Uh, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. What's he saying here? This is just a different, a little easier understanding of the same passage, just new living. Hebrews 13, 9. Uh, so don't be attracted by strange new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace. That's actually a very biblical description of what grace is. You know, when Paul prayed, uh, uh, Lord, remove this thorn from my side, and God said, my grace is sufficient for you, most people think that that's God saying no. In other words, I'm going to have some mercy on you, so my grace is sufficient for you means you just got to sit in it and suffer. That's not what he was saying. What he was saying is, if you know what grace is, my power that works inside of you, the divine influence directly from my spirit on your heart is what you need in this situation. God saying, my grace is sufficient for you is not a no, it's a solution. And that solution is, my strength is in you. You don't need me to show up externally and fix this situation for you. You need to feed on my spirit inwardly so that you rise above this situation, that you overcome this situation by the power that is in you. Amen? All right. Grace is God's favor, strength, and influence in and upon your heart. Grace is not mercy. Mercy is when God forgives you and you don't deserve it. Grace is power that works in you. It's a spiritual gift. It's a carice. It's, a, it's an outworking of the Spirit of God that brings about capacity and strength. When you, when you operate in the gifts of the Spirit, you're operating in the graces or the abilities or the capacities of the Spirit. For you to be dumb, and God gives you some wisdom, and you apply that wisdom, and it changes your life, that is the outworking of grace. The agent that rises up within you that gives you that wisdom is an expression of what grace is. Does that make sense to you? So, it's a good thing that your heart be established with grace. In other words, it's a good thing that that part of you that drives everything that you do is established in the power of God working through you. It's a good thing that that part of you where you believe from, that that part of you that subconsciously makes decisions, it's a good thing that that part of you, the deepest part of you, is conditioned to feed on God's strength and ability. But if your heart's sick, 
You're going to lay in the bed and not take your vitamins. You're going to lay in the bed and you're not going to drink water. And however, this relates to whatever it is that you know you need to apply to your life. Are you with me? You're dealing with this particular sin habit. You're dealing with a, some kind of lack. Maybe you're dealing with trauma. Maybe you were legitimately victimized. You genuinely lost something in your life. You have been attacked and hurt. You have been used, maybe. Maybe there is a legitimate situation where you have the right to say, I'm a victim here. And I'm not minimizing that because those, those situations are difficult. I mean, we hear these stories of people, gosh, what's going on in the world? And it's just so dark and you can't, I mean, even right now in this moment, there are people going through some of the most horrific things that a human could conceive and imagine. Trapped somewhere, locked somewhere. There are people starving, walking around, trying to find water and food. We are directly connected in ministry to places that, you know, the world, that it's hurting out there. There are people right now, there are young girl. I heard of a 10-year-old. I mean, you know, even the president brought this as I heard it from him. A 10-year-old was traveling over state lines to go get an abortion because she'd been raped. Ah, it's heartbreaking what's going on in the world right now. And the things that you are going through and have gone, some of you are sitting there in pain right now. Some of you are sitting there and, and you're like, you're so overcome with debt and stress, you don't know how you're going to get out of it. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you're facing, the way out of it is grace in your heart strengthening you. God's ability inside of you giving you a power that's greater than anything you can muster up on your own. You yielding to His inner working. We're going to talk, I mean, we're, we're, we're keep, let me keep going here just so you give you a few solutions of how to do this. And it's, it, we're just looking at biblical models of how to feast on His Word to bring about the, the environment of peace inwardly so grace will work. You need grace to work. It mostly works in the environment of peace. In fact, let's go ahead and read that passage. This is Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord, so rejoice. If you're heart sick, you don't feel like rejoicing. When we're constantly feeding to ourselves all the reasons that we shouldn't rejoice, you're not going to feel like rejoicing. Are you with me? Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious. These are, these are like commands. Don't be anxious. Think about that. Do not. Don't raise your, yeah. Stop it. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. But how many of you struggle with anxiety? This is a hard one. This is, I'm sick. I'm laying in bed. Those vitamins are in there. I know they're going to help me. I should probably drink some water. I should probably go pray because I know all that stuff's going to help me. This is kind of like one of those things. You're feeling anxious. Do not be anxious. You just want to go, nom, 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 nom. You don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear that. You don't, you don't want to take on that kind of responsibility, especially if you've got a condition, if you've got, an, if you've got a reason. I'm not picking on people that feel anxious. I'm, not, I'm really I'm not trying to. I just know it's very common, and it just happens to be in this passage. But it says, do not. I mean, you know, you can be offended or you can let that do something inside of you. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Why? Because then something goes, becomes active within you. It's not that you're laying it to God going, God, please do something. Change me. Nothing's changed. I'm just going to stay here and be heart sick. Please, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. Philippians 4, 7. So, all right, so rejoice. Get a hold of your emotions. Pray. Be thankful. Talk to God about it. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace guards 
your heart. Why do you need your heart guarded? Because grace works in your heart. What is grace? It's God's strength and ability working in you to empower you, to overcome whatever it is that's coming against you. Peace, let's define it. The, tra the, the tranquil state. So how do you cultivate peace? If peace guards my heart, how do I get some of this peace? Well, Romans 5, 1, we stand in this peace that we have with Him. We are one with Him. Uh, this is just straight out of the strong, uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon here. Peace, the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God. I love that part. Fearing nothing from peace is when you're not afraid of God. He's not the problem. He's not bringing the pain into your life. Uh, and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort that it is. Now that doesn't mean you accept it. Because if there's a promise, a promise against whatever your earthly lot is, you believe that, that it will overcome that situation. Because a lot of people thought, well, I just need, you know, just blessed be God. If it's just God's will, I'll just stay here and die. Peace guards the heart, and the heart is where grace is produced. If our hearts are going to be established in grace, we have to steward peace in our heart. You must steward peace in your heart. Jesus addresses it. Peace I leave with this is John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Here's another, here's another one. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. It's a choice. Fear is a choice. To be overcome by your situation is a choice. I get it. You've been hurt. You're sick. The doctor's report says this. I mean, I understand all that. Maybe not to the degree that you personally are walking through it and experience it because I've not been in your shoes. But the solution is the same. Do not let your heart be troubled. Why? Why would he say don't let your heart be troubled? Because that's where grace works. And you need grace to overcome. What is grace? It's his power. It's his ability. It, it's almost as if you could look at grace as the effects that vitamin C has on your immune system. You take, a vitamin, you take vitamin C, it starts to work within your body, it nourishes all the stuff that needs to happen so your immune system gets stronger. Grace is like spiritual power and strength that brings life. And you feed on it. And again, Mark 4, he says it. The Word, the, the, uh, it's like the farmer who casts seed in the ground. He goes to sleep, he wakes up, he doesn't know how it happens, but the seed bears forth and produces after its own kind. Put the word in there. Watch grace work. It just this, I mean, I don't, I don't know any other solution than feeding on the word of God, letting it change our expectations back to hope, overcoming trauma, weakness, grieving, grievedness. You with me? Couple more, couple more. Cultivating peace to allow grace to work. Psalm 119, 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Are you struggling with sin? Do you have some sin habit that just eats your lunch, makes you feel guilty and afraid and ashamed, and you're embarrassed by it and you can't tell anybody else about it? Hide his word in your heart. How does that work to overcome sin? Because grace will spring forth as you hide that word in your heart. Specifically, identity-related word as it relates to that area of your life. If it's sexual in nature or something you know, dark like that, hold in your heart that you have been made holy, that you have been cleansed by the blood of God, that you are justified by the work of the Lamb, that you are indwelt by the holy presence of the living God. See, this is the opposite of what performance-centered religion would teach you. Reli performance-centered Christianity would teach you overcome the sin, do better to get more holy. New Covenant finished work perspective says you already are holy. 
Now believe it, own it, cultivate it so that it overcomes that dead man mentality that is not who you really are. You're behaving that way, but that's not who you are. You feed on the word that you have been made, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And when you actually believe that, when you have the associated emotions that you are righteous, you're not going to choose sin. And then it rewires everything in your physical being and changes even your natural desires, even so that your body doesn't crave it anymore. Because you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Inside of you is a holy place because that's where God lives and God can't be anywhere that's not holy. I mean, whatever it takes, you cultivate that. You, don't, you might need to cast the devil away. You might need to go through inner healing, but what you really need to do is believe who you are in Christ. And when you believe it, when that is more real to you than anything else, that is your reality. You already have it. It just becomes your experience over what you're experiencing. Are you with me? I don't know any other solution. I don't know any other solution. There's another one. Psalm 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Watch what you say. Watch what you meditate on. It's part of the process. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. A crushed spirit, a broken heart, a sick heart. Man, man, the world is the world is heart sick. A lot of the Christian world is heart sick. It just is. And it's hard to choose joy. It's hard to get up out of that bed when you're feeling sick, feeling sorry for yourself. You don't want to go do what you need to do to feed your body what it needs to overcome. You don't want to do it. You don't want to feed your emotions. You don't want to renew your mind. I get it. It's easier to stay heart sick. But Jesus didn't die for you to stay heart sick. He wants you to enjoy the peace that he has for you. Not just so that you can have a perfect, quaint little life and your world over here is good to go. It's not just for you. God needs you to be heart healthy so that he can work through you and you can be a blessing to this world to bring glory to his name. I mean... What other hope does the world have other than heart-healthy Christians going to them, bringing them the good news? What other hope will the world have? And it's not about leading with the finger of condemnation and truth. It's true. It's male and female. See there? I'm right. You're wrong. How's that going to work? Truth without love is legalism. And love without truth is permissiveness. Love and truth, grace and truth. We don't back down from the truth, but we lead with love. You can't lead with love if your heart's sick. You're mad at yourself. You're mad at the world. You're mad at the president. You're mad at the whatever. You're mad at your parents. You're mad at your kids. You're mad at your boss. Well, it's their problem. It's their problem. I, I, people send me an email. Somebody sent me a message this week. Well, you know, I'm good, but could you get these other people to, or, or you know, pray that these other people will do right? I mean, it's essentially what it said. It's like, so, so I send back. Okay, well, how, so I pray. I feel like the Lord gives me a leading. I lay the responsibility back on this person and what they're going to do in that situation, and then it's a bounce back. Well, no, it's it's always just you're going to. It's like trying to help a wounded dog. It's going to bite you. It's just, you know. Peace. That's why we focus so much on mind renewal. Focus on, you know, meditation, physical relaxation, the process of getting a hold of your body and your emotions to the point where you can cultivate the Word of God because it will produce change. If you have the mindset that God's in control and you're just waiting on Him to do it all and make it happen, good luck. I don't know how you live that way, honestly. But if you have the mindset that God in you will lead you and guide you and you have a responsibility to choose life, to choose joy, to put the Word in there, I can work with that. I 
feel like I poked a nest, bee's nest on that one, but peace, peace. Cultivate peace in your heart because that is the environment that grace will work. It's a good thing that your heart be established with grace. I feel like I want to give you a homework assignment to go and do a word study on the benefits and the fruit of grace. If you so choose to accept this mission. <laughs> and I promote this website a lot, but openbible.info, openbible.info, go there. It really any topical Bible, but openbible.info, click on topical and then just search you know, whatever, whatever's rolling around in your heart today from this message, and just search it, and just get the word in there. Get, the, get what the Bible says about that area into your heart. It's the only solution. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up, if you will. Put your attention on him. Jesus, we thank you for this. We thank you that you gave us your peace, not as the world gives, but we trust you. Just say, I will not let myself be afraid. I will trust God. I will choose joy. I will cultivate peace and allow grace to work in my heart. Now just, just take just a minute and think about that. Just meditate on that. It's a good thing that my heart be established in grace. Peace guards my heart. Your grace is seeking to work in my body, in my mind, in my soul, in my will, in my emotions, in my choices, in every aspect of my being. Even in this moment, I'm being conformed into your image to reflect your glory, so I yield to you. Just, just tell him, I yield to you, Holy Spirit. I trust you. I give you, I present my body to you, this living sacrifice to just be transformed. I trust you. I want to follow you. I want to obey you. I thank you that I'm at peace with you. And I will put the work in to renew my mind to allow your grace to work through me. I don't want to limit your grace from transforming me and empowering me and strengthening me anymore. I don't want to just lay in the bed heart sick. I don't want to just stay stuck in trauma, heart sick, not doing the things that I know are good for me to experience but you're, because your grace is available. I trust you and I love you. I trust, just tell him I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. If you're in the room today <clears throat> or you're watching online, you've never said yes to Jesus and you'd like to, we have a couple of prayer ministers up here. The way that we do it is I'd like for you to come forward after, after we dismiss, come forward and talk to these guys. We have a gift for you. If you're watching online, you can go to our website, forward.church, right on the homepage there. There's a Who is Jesus button. Click on that and connect with us and engage with us. And if you're in this place and you're born again, but you've not experienced the baptism of the Spirit or the yielding to the indwelling presence of God, you don't lack anything. There's just a putting on of the Spirit that you can experience. If you'd like to experience that today, come forward and talk to these guys. I'll walk you through a process. Or if you need prayer for anything at all, you know, maybe some of you, you, you didn't raise your hand, or if you want a little bit more prayer for what you talked about with the other person today, just slide on up here. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather together. We just want to host your spirit daily in our lives. We want to walk into this world hosting your spirit within us to show the world how good that you are, to experience the benefits of being a kingdom child, safe in your family because of the work of Christ. Lord, I speak over every person's finances. I thank you that generosity springs up in our hearts <clears throat> as we give, not, of, not out of obligation, not out of law, not out of legalism, but out of purpose, out of a sense of purpose to help other people know your goodness, to help other people hear the gospel. We want to sow into that and in all the things that we get to do, Father. We thank you and we trust you and we make the decision right now just one last thing, in your heart, see yourself trusting God to be your provider. Just tell him, I thank you, Father. You're a good father. You desire to provide for me. Thank you for your kindness toward me. I trust you. In Jesus' name.
Amen. 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 I'm in. Amen. Amen. Jesus said you must be born again to enter into his kingdom. He's done everything to provide eternal life for you, and you only receive it by grace through faith. And we want to help you be sure in your salvation. You know, maybe you're new to Christianity. Maybe you're discovering things about God for the first time in your life, and you don't really know what it's all about. I've been there, trust me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't know anything about God when I got born again and tried to approach the Bible, and it didn't make sense to me. So we want to help you. If you go to forward.church and click on Who is Jesus, we have a simple article on there that explains salvation, everything he did for you, how to begin to read the Bible and start to live a Christian life and incorporate his principles and how to engage the Holy Spirit for empowerment. You know, his grace wants to transform you. His love wants to make you whole. And we want to help you. If you've made the decision to be born again today for the first time, or maybe even a recommitment, and you're just not even sure what to do, how to approach the Bible, reach out to us. Email us at info at forward.church or call our office 770-828-5826. Go to our website, find the article on who is Jesus, and get started. He loves you. He's for you. He will lead you and guide you, and we want to help you. If you'd like to give today, you can give directly at our website, forward.church slash give, or you can text any gift amount to 84321. Thank you so much for your generosity. Would you like to stay connected with us? Then visit forward.church slash connect and click online guest. You'll receive texts and emails with links to free resources and notifications when we're going live on Facebook and YouTube. You are invited to join our Facebook group where you can interact with our pastors and our local and online church members. Visit forward.church and click online community under the ministries tab or go to facebook.com slash group slash forward church. Thanks for watching today. I hope you got something helpful out of this message that you can apply to your life. If you did and you like what you heard, we have hundreds of free resources available online at forward.church or on my blog at clintbyers.com. We also have a church YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. We have SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, we have it out there. Go like and subscribe to our social media platforms and share those. You know, it's, it's really an opportunity for evangelism to get these materials out online and you can help us. I would ask you to consider supporting Forward Church financially, but then you can also be a great help by going to these social media platforms, follow the accounts, like and subscribe to the videos that will drive up our viewership and we will reach more people together. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We invite you to make the journey. Experience transformation from the heart through our free discipleship resources available at forward.church slash the journey. There you'll find free online courses, recommended reading, and other resources. For tons of free messages and other great resources, go to clintbuyers.com.